the nexus of the idea is how does nits how is the YouTube community online mm -hmm. given black creators and women of color creators an opportunity to have a voice mm -hmm. on a level where they're really impacting and engaging the uh, audience internationally. Mm -hmm. and I think you guys are to me at the forefront. No one's in the same clicks and views and subscriptions that, that fan TV is. Right. And you guys have also inspired and collaborated with all these other great content creators mm -hmm. out there. It seems like a real family mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh and you guys are open up opportunity for Knit fans to have a voice and to comment, whether through super chats or you know uh, Instagram or Twitter or the Discord. So you know, I just wanted to have a conversation with you as one of the the linchpins of that. Mm -hmm. um, Pinball and its media, baby. Yeah, Let's do it. No problem. No problem. Start out. Uh, let me know. Like, when did you start watching? And mm -hmm. what year did you catch on and become a Knit fan? And what was the impetus that got you into rooting for the Knicks? Yeah. Uh, to, to become loyal to them as, a, as, a, as your favorite team. Man, I started watching around like the 93 season. And it, it was just growing up, you know, watching NBA on NBC. You would just see the Knicks were always on, right? They were going up against the Bulls or the Pacers or the Celtics. And those games always sent like, seemed like, even the regular season games, they always seemed like they meant something. Like they were always magnified. And if it was at the Garden, it would be a packed house and the building would be rocking. And there was just an energy about it that, you know, you, you just felt so proud as someone who lived in New York. you come up uh, born and raised in New York. You just felt like the guys who were, who were wearing that jersey, that New York in the front, they were representing you. You know, and they were fighting for you and and and, and grinding it out and, and, you know, to the to the end, 48 minutes of basketball, they were really trying to put on for the city. And then on top of that, you had uh, Patrick Ewing, you know, I'm, I'm a Jamaican American, uh, you know, family from Jamaica as well. So Patrick Ewing was somebody who we always rooted for uh, just off of the strength, uh, of the, you know, that off of his, his nationality. And so that was always like one of my heroes, one of my idols growing up. So it, it was real easy to latch on to that team. Did you ever think by committing to the Knicks that it would end up being what it was for the last 20 years? And how have you survived the last 20 years? You know what? It's the thing about New York sports is that you, you a lot of us just, just, are just so loyal to these teams and the nineties Knicks, the success, the failures, they were, they were always competing. They were always competing, you know, whether it's the playoffs, they made the finals two years in 94, 99. But throughout that, that you know, that decade or, or a little bit more, they were always there, you know, competing for a playoff spot and, and trying to get in there. And so, you know, 9-4, we were right there. We were right on the cusp. And, and I feel like we, we've always been trying to chase that energy and recreate that magic with this team. And so... Every year, you're like, okay, can we can we get can we recapture that magic, you know? And I think that that's the thing about New York. It's like we're, we're just so loyal to our teams, uh, e even when they don't give us a reason to be, man. So the last twenty years for me, it's been rough, especially since since that '90s era and the mismanagement, the bad trades, and the bad draft picks, and the scandals, and so it's been tough. The, all the losing, it's been tough to get through, man. But it, it's it's. I, I don't see it any other way. I just can't root for any other team, man. You know. I am with that 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, once you stop, you can't stop. I mean, once you start, you can't stop. That's it's just, it. That, that's you're, it. In, you're, you're in for life. It's yeah, like, you're, it's in, like man. you're in. You're in. You're in, in a prison game yard, man. Yeah, it's just yeah. the way it is. Before you start your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. did you have uh, media inspiration guys that you listened to, whether, mm -hmm. whether it was on the radio or on TV, that you wanted to kind of mold yourself after, or were you more in, interested in creating mm -hmm. your own lane? Uh, I mean, I was always interested in creating my own lane, but there's no doubt that, you know, uh, listening to Mike and the Mad Dog on Sports Radio 660 was was it. You know, that was the basis for why I started why, what, what I started, because their influence on sports, on, on, you know, on being a fan and their grip on the sports media market just can't be denied. You know, just, come, just coming up and listening to those guys. I used to listen to those guys, listen to that station. Waking up, turn it on. I'm driving to work, driving to school, turn it on. Going home, it's on because that was how you would hear those fan reactions to whether it's a post game result, whether it's a trade, whether it's a trade rumor. That's how you one got the information because this was still pre Twitter age, pre twenty four seven news cycle. That's really how you would get it. You would listen to to the to the host. And then you would wait. They would have the 20-minute flash. So every 20 minutes, they would do a news update. 
So the 20 minute flash is really what you're waiting for to get caught up to speed on the latest rumor or, you know, whatever uh, scandal or something, whatever was going on that day. You were waiting to hear that update and then it would go back to the host, back to the fans. So that that was my basis and, and, and like the foundation for everything that I did. And then along the way. Uh, ESPN radio came about. So I used to listen to Stephen A when he was on there, Max Kellerman, uh, Brandon Tierney, those guys. So uh, all those guys really, really influence what, what I'm doing right now. What were some of your goals you want to accomplish mm-hmm. when you first started the, the YouTube channel? Like what, what was your one year goal or, or two year goal upon a uh, initiating <laughs> project? Man, <laughs> when I first started, I really didn't have any goals, man, because I had no media training experience. I had no experience making videos. I was never someone who was just, you know, in front of a camera and just put myself out there like that. So I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I was just trying to start this channel up create some content and, and see what was going to happen. Uh, and I, I, I would just go back and say from an ins- inspiration standpoint, when it came to fan channels and building community, um, the English Premier League fan communities, I think that has done it the best. And so I would watch uh, Arsenal fan TV for the Arsenal fans. I would watch United stand. I would watch at the time it was called full-time devils. Now it's called uh, Stratford paddock. I would watch those channels and I would just see how they would engage with their fans and the passion and the fanaticism that would come out, you know, from, from those voices and them capturing the reaction and the opinions of those fans. And I just looked, I was like, you know, we're from New York. We have the, the sports radio. We are the sports radio generation. I was like, this can easily be done in New York because we have so much passion that's so bottled up and it needs to come out somewhere. And even though sports radio has been around and it's still continuing this day, there was just so much that I didn't like about it where I felt like I could come in and, and really capture a, a, that white space where sports media was lacking. You know, the constant commercials, uh, the 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 lack of coverage, in-depth coverage of the team, especially during those dark 20 years when the Knicks really weren't doing much. You know, they might, they might cover them for maybe a half hour on, on, on a show during the basketball season, maybe not. So you weren't really getting that, right? On, on the national media scale, you weren't getting that in-depth coverage. All you were getting was the hot rumor, who's the guy that's being linked to the Knicks, what's James Dolan doing, but you weren't in the, in the weeds, Right, you weren't covering the acquisition of the twelfth guy on the team or the thirteenth guy on the team, and there were people out there that want to know about that stuff, yep. that care about it, that really want to see how this team is growing year over year or regressing year over year. So I just felt like there was a white space there that nobody re- was really tapping into, and you know when I when I grew the channel, that was the intention. It was to bring the fans closer in, bring especially the out of towners closer in. By, by building that community and giving the fans an outlet to be heard in the digital age, in the 24-7 news cycle, on that on-demand content consumption. I just felt like there was an opportunity there. And that was really, I guess if you want to call it the goal, that was really it, you know, in, in that first year. What was an early benchmark you feel like you hit that really like propelled you to another level early on? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it was the Chris Childs interview. That was my first player interview that was the first legit interview that I ever did and we did it live for the first time and the reaction of the fans was uh, it was just out of the world out of the park the stories that he told about those late 90s Knicks he was very candid it, it was epic you know he talked about the 90s Knicks he talked about the the, the incident with Kobe the playoff battles with the heat it, it was just end to end so comprehensive I thought the internet, the interview came out well, and, and the fans were very receptive to it. That was definitely one of the first, I guess, milestones for the channel because each interview I did, I would kind of package those up and go to the next guy, like, "Hey, we, we want to get you on," and it, it just caught fire from there. My favorite interview you've done is with Chain Fry. Mm-hmm. I think that that's interesting. I, I didn't, I didn't, I never heard that one before. The, the reason is because of all the periods, that was the darkest period for me was the Isaiah Thomas years. Mm-hmm. It, got, it got pretty bad in Phil. Mm-hmm. But Isaiah with sexual harassment scandal and the Marbury infighting, the Larry Brown half a season <laughs> coaching, I want to know what the fuck was going on yeah. in the locker room. Yeah. And he, for the first time, illuminated what was happening with, hey, if, are you from the city? You're starting. When I heard that type of stuff, yeah. 
was at the level of dysfunction that I thought was existing was a whole it was a whole nother seismic scale. What do you think about that that interviewing guys that are role players but have a really intense and in-depth knowledge of what yeah. was going on in a specific period of time? What was Chain Fry like to, in terms of importance in interviewing someone like that to find out behind the scenes during a dark day? I loved it. Uh, I definitely loved it. And like I said, this first time, first one, uh, you're the first person I, I really heard that from. But with him, number one, he's a candid personality. And that was the one thing that came off the off off right at me was that – he was he wasn't afraid to hold back on anything, man. You know, he had his glass of wine. I was chilling, and he was just ready to to let it go. But you're right that because that era, that that couple of years, especially like Larry Brown, the Isaiah years, there was so much was chaos crazy. and dysfunction, and it was just very interesting to see to hear like you know this is Larry Brown, you know, and and addressing him in practice and the the constant rotation changes and just the lack of preparation. I was super surprised to hear that that was happening with Larry Brown as the coach. This guy had just won the championship with the Pistons. You thought he was going to kind of recreate that magic or or have us in in some sort of contention, have us competing like that team and it was the complete opposite man it was it was absolute chaos so even though yeah he was a role player but he was still a lottery pick for this team and it was just very interesting to hear you know some of those early uh stories from from his perspective yeah there's an argument that may, he might have been the most herald lottery pick during that 10-year stretch from 2000 to 2010 yeah. mm-hmm. you know, argue for Gallerani or mm-hmm. argue for uh michael sweetney but i think he was the one that people thought would have an actual impact. Yeah. And he actually did have an impact yeah. once he got on the team. He was <laughs> right. a really solid player. Yeah. He was a really solid player and ended up having a long, successful career, mm-hmm. won a championship with Cleveland. I just loved I'm so glad you brought him on because mm-hmm. I loved the candidness with how dysfunctional the Dolan led nits were. I think that's a that's when L O L nits really that's it. started. That that was, was... During, during that period, it's like LOL, everything was LOL. Yeah. Steve Francis coming in 40 pounds overweight, you know? Michael Sweeney, he, he might be like suicidal. Like, it was insane, dude. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was an insane time. That uh, that was just the height of LOL Knicks. But, you know, that's part of what I why I love do, uh, doing what I do, man. Because we have a different content mix, right? The post-game show, that's our flagship. That That's the go-to after every game. You know where we're going to be at. You know what we're going to talk about. But hearing from the players that you, you you were rooting for during that time and and um the storytelling aspect of it i think that's priceless man that that's valuable information for fans like like you said i wanted to know what was going on you know the 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 xavier mcdaniel fan i wanted to know why he left the knicks yeah. and when when the x-man came on within the first five minutes i didn't even have to ask him <laughs> he just came out and said it because it seemed like it was on his mind as well to, to, to relay that information. So, and the, the, that was my number one most watched video, even to this day. Uh, the clips of it, the full interview, it's my most watched video. So, closing in on 200,000 views. Damn, uh, between, yeah, between the native video and, and the clips, the X Man video, no doubt about it, it's been the most consumed. You know, I'm thinking in the last 20 years as a Knit fan, mm-hmm. thinking about who have I watched and listened to for in depth, honest, truthful analysis. It's Stephen A. Smith and you. Appreciate it. What do you think about being an African-American black voice uh, digital creator in the knit sphere? What does it mean to be a minority voice and representat- representing a community, mm-hmm. a Jamaican community, mm-hmm. a black community uh, mm-hmm. in its media on a DIY mm-hmm. level? It's, it means everything because in sports in general, you have, you know, when you, when you, when you think about – Voices of influence is very few, and and it's very limited spots. It's a tough business to crack. You know, when I was coming up as a kid, I was like, oh, I want to work in sports. I want to work in sports in some capacity. And when you realize what opportunities were out there and how little they paid, you know, a lot of these teams and stuff like that, they want you to volunteer with them. They're, they're barely paying. They're giving you scraps. Uh, or or your your foot in the door was through the sales department or the ticket sales department is very hard to crack and so when I realized that I was like yeah I, I got to pivot man so I, I jumped into uh, I jumped into IT but later on as 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 I said it with these influences and and the ability to connect with an audience with just just any type of camera and the internet I said I'm gonna just take this leap and wherever it lands it lands and over the years of just you know, refining my skills and, and just continuing to, to hone in on that. 
I was like, you know, this is my passion. I'm, I'm going to double down on this. And so to have that voice as an African-American and have that influence, it's everything, man, because we're not very well represented in the industry like that. Yeah, you have your Stephen A's, he, but he's at the top of the chain. You know, he's at the top of the chain. And so part of my drive to continue to do this is to show others, you know, on the other side of the camera, to say, look, I'm doing this. You can do this. I'm hoping to influence people like that. I have my son coming up. My son's three. You know, I, I want to be able to capture these moments in an archive. No matter what the success or the failure is of this channel, like, this is for him to see, like, you can do this. You, you can be in front of it. Or you can take where, where take it from where I've, I've left it and take it to new heights. So wherever that may be. And so that, that means a lot to me, you know, to, to be uh, considered a, 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 a influential person in within, the, in within this space because it's just very limited. And, and to be honest, uh, if you look at most of the top media companies, whether it's ESPN, you want to look at a Barstool, you want to look at a Spock Sports, I mean, those are all run by people that don't look like me. A lot of, the, a lot of those personalities are people that don't look like me. And so, like I said, it's uh, it, it means a lot to 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 represent in that way. Yeah, I think that if you look at who's covering the nets in the major media outlet and who's covering the nets on the YouTube channels, Discord channels, Twitterverse, it's there's there's a complete dichotomy there. Like the question of are there creators or where are the creators? It's obvious they're on YouTube, and I don't understand why on a self a self run DIY level, nets morning coffee into the nets uh, Nick of Time, you guys, it's all these black and brown voices and creators are doing their thing. Why isn't that represented on a, a mirroring what's happening in the mainstream news? The, why do you think it's, it's yeah. what do you think is a part of that? And how can you and other creators break that ceiling and into an opportunity where you guys become the mainstream? Yeah, I, I think, <clears throat> you know, the, the reason it looks like that on the mainstream, I just think it's it's just been a history of uh, corporate America and, and hiring practices. You know, when, when you when you go back in time, you understand that those opportunities were, were limited for people that look like me. And so when you have, uh, you know, more white, white voices, you have the white decision makers. And I, I always look at things from a relationship standpoint where it may not be intentional discrimination or racial discrimination. Sometimes it may be, but to me, it, it's also relationships, Right. Who do you know? Who did you go to school with? Who's in, in your reference group? Who's lives in your neighborhood that you want to help out? You know, you, you have a neighbor whose son wants to get into the business and you give him that opportunity over someone else. And I think it, that that type of, you know, connectivity, that type of network is why you have a lot of people dominating that space that don't that don't necessarily look like me. Um, you know, how do we change that? I think what, what I'm doing right now is a way to change that because it's inspiring more and more people to say, I want to get out and, and do this. It may not be in sports. It could be in a totally different industry. But even if it is, is in sports, as I said, um, the power of the internet right now, I'm out here, I'm reaching people all across the world. Somebody's going to get inspired to, to do this, to do it in their way, to do it better. And you can, you can capture that audience just as much as that person that's working at a, at a mainstream outlet can capture that audience. And so the, the, the playing field is being level and the barriers of entries is, is being, is, is a lot lower than it has been in, in the past, right? In the past, pre-internet, you want to try to get into those major publications. You want to get with the New York times or the daily news or the New York post and so on and so forth. And again, there's limited spots. There's only a few guys that are covering the beat, for the Knicks, for each of those publications. You know, New York New York Post may have two or three. Daily News, maybe two. Newsday, two. That's it. You know, New York Times, maybe two or three. That's it. Handful. And they've been there forever, too. And, and they don't they leave. <laughs> they don't leave. My guy, Mark Berman, New York Post, 20-plus years on the beat. That's you know, right. they do not leave. You know, Mike Lupica was holding it down for the Daily News for, for a long, long time, for, for ages. Still does occasionally write for them. So, again, it's just, it, it's hard, it's a hard business to crack. Well, I'll tell you, man, I, I was in the art world for the last 10 years as a curator and an arts writer. It was your show that inspired me to pivot and start covering basketball as well. Mm. I saw what you were doing, and I was like, as a, a Mexican-American writer, I was like, man, 
I got to get my voice out there and start covering the Knicks mm-hmm. in a capacity that might not be given to me. I got to go out there and take it and make my own way. So right. I just want to give you a shout out and appreciation for being for an sure. inspiration for someone like me uh, a little bit later on in life. Could pick up the pen and start to write up, cover the Knicks. And write nice. About that. Nice, man. Do you ever feel a need or a uh, responsibility to talk about some of the social issues mm-hmm. in terms of class and race and police brutality mm-hmm. that's happened in the country on the show? Um, do you, has that crossed your mind to maybe incorporate a level of that? Or do you feel there needs to be a separation between what you're doing with the Knicks and other ventures? No, you know, we, we did that. Um, especially during the pandemic, it just seemed like that also coincided with a lot of the police brutality issues that came into the forefront, the George Floyd incidents, you know, Breonna Taylor, there were so many that were just, uh, you know, a chain of events. And then on top of that, being in the pandemic, you had to talk about it. And we, we would talk about it through our interviews. You know, we would talk to, to Quentin Richardson, ask him, how is that impacting him? Charlie Ward, all those guys that we spoke to during the pandemic, Rashid Wallace, uh, Chuck D, we would talk to them about that. Kenyon Martin, we, we would talk to them about that because it was real. And everybody was going through the same struggle at the same time. We, we were trying to figure out, okay, what is this pan- whole pandemic? How am I going to keep my family safe? And as African Americans, we're like, what is going on with the interactions with the police? And how do I keep myself, my kids safe? What's the conversation that I need to have with them? You know, to, to keep them out of that, out of a, a, a tricky situation like that. So it was very much in front of us and there was no way to escape it. I felt like we had to speak on it, speak on our own experiences. And I, th- I thought I thought it was well received. You know, I, I know at the end of the day, we all got to eat and sponsorships and product placement is a vital part of that. If you want to continue to grow mm-hmm. and build the capital you have to increase the awareness of your brand. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process behind deciding to incorporate product placement and sponsorships to Rochelle first with Manscaped Mm -hmm. and now with Prize Picks? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a growth, uh, you know, opportunity. It's a way to continue to uh, invest. And, and I just always look at it that way. You know, there's, there's different revenue streams that, that we have, in in the building these independent up in independent um lanes right you have uh your advertising you have your fan donations and then you know so the the brand marketing was just another extension of it it's a it's a reflection of of the growth of the channel you know as you grow you you will attract um some of these more not mainstream but some of these bigger brands more more respected brands and for me it was just a matter of what are the brands that that i use what are the brands that I trust uh, reputationally? Uh, how are the products? And is this something that it makes sense for my audience? And with the Manscaped, that was one. You know, that was a product I use. And it, it's it's taken on a life of its own within the channel and in, in how we pitch it. Because it's not just a, a pushy sales pitch. It's become, uh, you know, so, some of the sacred words and some of the rituals that we, it's, it's almost become a ritual. You know, when we do our Manscaped reads, the fans are always anticipating it. And they, they, we always have a laugh about it because, you know, it was real life as men. You know, yes. we, we incorporate those, those, those men jokes, the locker room jokes, so on and so forth. So I've been able to kind of incorporate that uh, into the show and, and, and it's been well received. So the, the brand marketing is certainly a path that's allowed us to, again, invest in, um, some infrastructure, as you see, you know, I've upgraded my camera, upgraded my set. I've hired more people. I've expanded the team, and so it, it's been it's been vital. It's been vital for us. Is uh, sponsorship and brand collaborations the main stream of revenue, or mm-hmm. is it the super chats? Like, what's kind of the hierarchy of what helps fund and keep the show yeah. going? Well, certainly, certainly sponsorship and brand revenue because you can you can kind of close deals uh, for a season. So you, so you're getting that that volume uh, and and the revenue, and you you can kind of foster relationships w- with with that brand and with that vendor, and so. Yeah, we can do brand reads for the show, but we can also do uh, giveaways. We can do, uh, you know, in-person activations. There's so much that we can do from that standpoint. I, th- I think right now that's that's our biggest uh, revenue stream right now. What's been the process like? Uh, I know the pandemic has probably put a pause on it, mm-hmm. but the correlation between the online community and mm-hmm. then activating that in real life mm-hmm. and games and meetups. Mm-hmm. How do you try to build that bridge between the two? 
Yeah, so since the bad pandemic, it's been hard. Uh, but we have we we do group events at Madison Square Garden. So so we did uh, the past two years. Well, this past season and the 2019 season, we've done um, events for the home opener, and, and that was great. So the first time we did it, it was great. We had a hundred people, you know, sold out two suites at Madison Square Garden, and then you get to meet those people who are on the other side of the camera who you had no idea who's watching you or, or the type of impact that you have. And that's always a, a rewarding experience. And then this year we took it up a notch where we did a, a live show pregame at the, at a, at a restaurant, in New York city, Mustang Harry's. Then we went to the game for the group event, went into uh it was double overtime, I think thriller. And mm-hmm. so that's been good, man. And, and we're, we're going to look to continue to capitalize on it. We, we do about three events or so a year and we're going to continue to expand as we start, you know, getting back into the fold and, and the pandemic lessons. It definitely something that, that we want to continue to grow in and meet those people that, that support us. You know, meet, meet those people that support us on a daily basis. It, it, it's vital. I've always been curious what the online YouTube Knits community is like. Do you hang out with other channels? Mm-hmm. Have you like, have you guys had collaborative meetups mm-hmm. with the fans? Do you mm-hmm. like chat? Do you text? Like the other channels that are doing the same thing as you, what's that like? Oh, oh, we talk every day. <laughs> we talk every day. Whether whether it's the guys on my team, you know, Alex, JD, CK, I, I have a whole KnicksFanTV.com staff, so we have the Slack going where, where we're talking every day, nonstop, twenty four seven. We also have the Discord, you know. I mean, and that's not that's not content creators, but we have a whole Discord community who's keeping keeping that energy going on a twenty four seven cycle. Um, when I met, I don't even remember how I met CK, man, but CK's out in LA and I have family in LA as well. So when I would go to LA, we would do meetups. So, we, so we've had LA meetups with Knicks fans out there. Uh, we shot some content out there as well. So we've continued to grow our relationship that way. We've met up in Vegas for Summer League and, and shot content out there. And so that's how, you know, my relationship with him has been growing and developing and then uh, with uh, like Nick's Film School, Jonathan Macri, you have Alex Wolf with the Strickland and, and posting and toasting and those guys. We pre-pandemic we we would do um, watch alongs, meetups in the city. The biggest one we did was was the the draft lottery party that was actually televised by ESPN. That was the 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 Zion lottery, the big one after the seventeen win season, and we got the third pick, which is RJ, which is still great. <laughs> You know, but the the anticipation of trying to get Zion in that big off season that was covered and, and well documented as well. So, uh, it, it's a great community. Th- those guys are really good guys. We're planning on doing something uh, later this season. I, I think we we're planning on do something at, at the All Star break, but I haven't heard back. But um, yeah, you know the the relationship we fostered over the years has been uh, valuable as well, man. It's been priceless. How do you balance your your personal life? This is the first time when you told me that your kid was on your your uh, yeah. computer. I didn't even know you had kids. Yeah. What? Uh, how do you balance like your mm-hmm. personal life with what has been a very consuming side gig has turned to a full time job? Yeah. For you, how do you balance? Yeah. Two? So in the beginning, it's uh, it's hard, right? Because you, you're trying to get something off the ground, so it's it's very demanding. But um, you put it in perspective. And so my son definitely comes first. Everything that he needs comes first. Uh, whether, whether it's, you know, taking him to school, picking him up from school, you know, making sure he, he's got a, a shower and dinner and going to bed and, and having that, you know, dad and son time. So that's always, uh, that's always takes priority. And then, you know, in the beginning, it's, it's long nights. <laughs> it's long, right? Because you're watching the game, you're doing the post game. And then before I even had a team, I was doing all the prep work after that, which is, you know, uploading to the podcast or cutting up content or planning social media content. So for a long time, I was a one man show and, and it's, it's hard. It, it's a very, it's a lot of long nights, you know, for the people that want to do it, it, it's definitely a sacrifice as well. And, and you need that, that, uh, you, you need support because you can't do it alone. You know, whether it's family life or, or building your brand, you need a support system. And so I've been lucky to have that as well. So it helps me kind of balance. Now, over time, I've been able to expand the team, which has been vital. So now I've been able to delegate those tasks that, you know, were so time consuming for me, whether it's the video editing or, or the podcast production or putting a newsletter together, the social media posting. 
or, you know, posting clips on YouTube, I've been able to delegate those things. So that's freed up a lot of my time now. And, you know, I, I can get, get back to the family life or I can continue to plan and, and build on the channel. So it just takes time. It's still a sacrifice, no doubt about it. You, you definitely need a support system. But as you begin to scale, it becomes a bit easier to, to manage. I'll tell you what, CP, every other Nick content creator I've talked to has all referenced you mm -hmm. and your work ethic and how you consistently put out content mm -hmm. no matter what. I mean, you, what's he like? You like walking into a store, getting out of your car, and you're talking about a trade rumor that happened, or a free agent signing that happened, or even a, a, a 16th man on the roster that just got signed. You'll take yeah. time out of your day to make sure that the fans know about it, and you'll give your opinion on on the situation. So every other content creator has referenced you <laughs> as being a man of the people and a hard worker on on, on putting up the content on the website. So shout out, appreciate it, man. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of work, but I I think when you find your passion, it doesn't seem like work. So this is a lot of fun for me. It's always been, this is, all, this is what I do. I talk sports, yeah. whether it's with my friends or with a stranger on the street, you know, I'll talk. <laughs> we, we can talk all day about it. So it, it's always, uh, you know, it, it's a passion of mine. And so it's very easy to, to do it. And, you know, whether it's I'm in the studio or if I'm in the car, as long as I got internet, you know, I'm going live for, for that second. And however it comes out, I always try to make sure it's quality. But, you know, it's just always fun interacting with the fans. And, uh, you know, them knowing that they can count on you to, to come through and deliver your opinion. It, it's um, it, it's a valuable, rewarding experience for sure. As you grow and your brand becomes more recognized, you got more people in the chat, more mm -hmm. people watching the streams. Mm -hmm. How do you moderate and mitigate the toxicity that could occur or pop up during conversations, whether it's directed toward you guys yourselves mm -hmm. or other callers, other fans, or kind of a team in general? Yeah, so I think... <laughs> People are going to have an, an opinion, yay or nay, right? Um, you know, YouTube has now gotten rid of the thumbs down button and just left the thumbs up. To me, I liked it when the thumbs down button was there. I just, it's just something that, that motivated me. I never took it personally. Uh, and though some, some fans would, man, some fans would really be irate that, you know, there'd be 1,000 likes and like 12 dislikes. But my, my saying is, you know, the love always overpowers the lame. So I never, I never took issue with it. You know, there's always going to be reactions from people behind a, a, a keyboard. You call them keyboard warriors. Sometimes it's going to be uh, kind of harsh. Sometimes it'll be in love. One of the things that we do is, number one, we have several moderators that moderate our chats. Uh, we ban certain words, certain terms that so those things don't get through at all. Uh, and then but then we also have moderators that moderate the chat. So if there's anything inflammatory or anything that's over the top, uh, we're, we're going to get that out and we're going to get that person out. You know, we don't have much tolerance for that either. As it pertains to, to taking the phone calls, we have a screener. So we have someone that's screening the phone calls, speaking to the person, getting an understanding of what you want to talk about. And that's worked for us, I think, 99% of the time. You know, we rarely, rarely, rarely have someone who can get through and, and just say something just completely inflammatory off the rails. So we try to protect the brand in, in as many ways as possible from those people that, that look to, uh, to wreak havoc and, 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 and put harm on, on, on your brand, you know, because you, you work so hard for it. So, and, and then now we call it the family show, man, because I want for you to be in the car with, with your kid to be listening to the show and not have to worry about, you know, just crazy language or just off the rail stuff. That's not me. That that's not who, who, who I am. Uh, on, on a regular basis and that's not how I want the show to be perceived you know it's it's not we're not barstool we're not Howard Stern we're, you know it, I want it to be a reflection of me and so yeah when I'm when I'm off the camera if me and you had a bar and watching the game now nah, it's not gonna be a family show but for this I just felt like it makes sense to broaden the appeal to the show for, for people of all ages so, because I want to get younger Knicks fans to understand the pain and the heartache that we go through, but also understand the game. You know, I feel like we bring sharp analysis to the game. So uh, I try to keep it open and, and clean up the language and as, as best as I can. So those are some of the ways that, you know, we, we try to protect it from uh, the, the inflammatory comments for sure. You mentioned having mods and strainers. How many people would you say in estimation since are you have on staff right now? Um, so the mod, you know, the mods are certainly volunteering and, uh, 
for those people, there's a lot of people who who have volunteered to do so. And then there's other people who I see as like regular viewers who are there on a regular basis. And I, I, I kind of bestow that honor, you know, on them because I feel like they, they're invested in the channel and they're, they're invested in the success of the channel and that I could have some degree of trust in them protecting uh, the chat. So those those that that's a chat. Um, as far as like people on payroll, I would say there's about probably six wow. six six people yeah congratulations man that's yeah. uh that's quite an accomplishment for yeah. building something organically from the ground up yeah appreciate it man appreciate it yep and you're able to facilitate that funding through majority of sponsorships and, and mm -hmm. product promotion or super chats mm -hmm. or a combination of both combination of both man you know just just that as the content is consumed uh the the opportunities come about for additional revenue streams and we just take that and put it right back into the channel you know, I, I don't need that. I, I need to grow. Um, my whole focus is, is on growth. And so uh, we've done that by, you know, getting consistent hosts, people who I think are, are sharp minds, are entertaining. And and again, on the back end infrastructure, which is vital, um, just people you want people who, who are doing things better than you can. You know, I, I taught myself video editing, but I'm not a video editor. You know, I can I can certainly do it. Uh, but, but, you know, to put the bells and whistles on it, that's, that's just not my forte. I don't have the time or, or the, the, the expertise for it. So, you know, you hire that person, you hire the marketing person to, you know, craft your newsletters and, and, you know, articulate it in a way that I can certainly do it. I just don't have the time and, and, uh, uh, uh you know, the, 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 all the skill sets to do it. So you certainly want to delegate those tasks out to the people who, uh, can complement your, your weaknesses or your blind spots. One of the things that I think separates your channel from others is every now and then I'll mm -hmm. hear hints that you are listening or have a contact that's giving you rumblings of what the front office is thinking. Mm -hmm. There almost seems to be like a bat channel between yourself and the Knicks FO. Mm -hmm. How have you cultivated those contacts and what percentage do you think of that is reality and ends up actually happening? Uh, what percent in, in terms of reality, in terms of... When you're hearing trade rumors, mm -hmm. possible signings, mm -hmm. uh, roster decisions like cutting a player mm -hmm. or bringing a player up from G League, how often does that actually happen? Mm -hmm. And how do you hold to so giving you this information? Yeah, so it's it's come unsolicited. <laughs> we we called in the plug. You know, the, the plug came yeah. to be uh, unsolicited then. And uh, the information has been good. You know, I, I think the information has been good. I, um, when I first started coming across those contacts, there was uh, one about Julius Randle being on the trade market, and that was about two years ago. Um, there was the Malik Beasley interest, which was which was also verified by the Athletic, even though Malik Beasley had you know signed with uh, signed with Minnesota. There was definitely um, legit interest from the Knicks. Uh, the Fournier deal. I was one of the first people to break the Fournier deal, and that was that came from uh, information from the plug as well. I'm just trying to think what else. Um, are, are all of these threads through the same person? Uh, I have a couple, couple different people, a couple okay. different people. I've had a, uh, a training camp report that, that, I, that I had leaked in terms of who was going to be in, in the running for the starting point guard last year. And it was between Alfred Payton and Dennis Smith Jr. And a lot of people, the Frank Hive was upset about that. They were like, man, you, you, you're not in there. You don't know anybody from the front office. And it played out just like that. Tibbs gave DSJ a chance. He struck out. Alfred Payton was next up. Frank really never had a shot in this thing. And ultimately, he is where he is. You know, that same training camp report I got was was that, you know, the Knicks wanted to see Mitchell Robinson improve on his maturity and, and really, um, you know, blossom in, in his, I believe he was coming into his, his third year with the team. When I had Alan Hahn on for the season preview, and he said, you know, the, the Knicks' concerns with, with Mitch is from the neck up. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, the, the information that I get, you know, I, uh, I, I trust the sources that, that I have. And, and it's been a, a benefit to the channel. You know, it's, a, it's not something I tell people all the time, you know, when I relay this information. It's not, I don't consider myself an insider. I don't want to be known to be an insider. I just tell the people all the time, if I get information that I can confirm is legit, I'm going to share it. I'm going to share it. And and so that that's just how I've been, you know, carrying it. What's been your process to initiate inquiries with former NIT players, mm -hmm. 
and other media personalities like Matt Kellerman or Alan Hahn, how do you facilitate those dialogues where they're on your show and you're having conversations on their shows like you do with Ian Begley? And in terms of um, getting them on the show? Yeah, just like making it happen. Yeah, I mean, you got to you gotta move heaven and earth, man. You just got to move heaven and earth and, and uh, reach out to these people, however, in, in, by any means necessary. And, and that's all we've tried to do. But I think the main thing is, as I said with the Chris Childs interview, is um, taking each one that you do and just hoping, hoping that it has a snowball effect. So the first interview you do, solicit the feedback. Was it good? Was it bad? How was the audio? How was how were the questions? Did you get everything you wanted out of it? You want to just continue to build on that and own in on your skills and, and perfect your craft of interviewing and perfect your, your production and make sure all that is sound and tight because as you go higher and higher up the chain, these people want to align themselves with quality. So you always want to make sure that your presentation, your delivery, and everything is quality. And once you have that, it becomes easier and easier to procure your guests because they can trust. You know, one, one, of, one of the interviews that I pr- take pride in the most and value the most is one that we did with Rasheed Wallace because he was, he was never known to be a media guy. And so for him to accept, you know, uh, a still on the rise channel, unknown to him, and sit down with us for, for an hour and change on it. And that was big for me because that was one of my favorite players as well. And like I said, I just felt like from a trust standpoint, um, we really had it with him. And that was an honor to, to have him on the show. So it, it's not easy. You know, a lot of these guys, these guys got to have lives. They have things to do. Um, they, you know, there's, there's players out there I've been reaching out to for, for years now. <laughs> I, still can't, I still can't get. Um, so sometimes it's just, it's just a matter of good timing. You got to be persistent. You have to you have to know you know their um, communication chain, the people to reach out to, whether it's a publicist or an assistant or a best friend. You just have to keep digging, man. You have to just keep keep uh, unwinding that cord until you, until you get your target. You're spitting game right now. I appreciate that. No problem. Mm-hmm. Who's a dream a person you would like to have on the show to interview? Patrick. Have you haven't gotten yet? Patrick. Patrick. <laughs> Uh, what about after Patrick? Who's, who's number two and number three? I would say Patrick, Mello, Mello, definitely Mello. Um, number three, I'd say Clyde. Yeah, I, I would definitely say Clyde in in the in those three. From a Knicks from from a, from a, a, a Knicks perspective, you know, there's a lot of people I'd love to talk to. Just you know, just just influencers and and people who've influenced me, but. Um, from a Knicks standpoint, I would say Patrick Mello Clyde. For sure. Have you ever tried to reach out to Starberry? I've been trying. I've been trying. Again, he's in China. He's you know he, he's aloof. He's here and there. That that's uh, it's still ongoing. The pursuit of Starberry is still ongoing, man. What's your uh, goal coming up for 2022? What do you mm-hmm. hope to accomplish? What do you hope to? What challenges have you placed put in place for yourself to mm-hmm. to reach and, mm-hmm. and uh, break through into the new year? Yeah, so for 2022, it's just it's really um, just continuing to expand, um, expand our capabilities, expand our content mix. You know, we want to um, <clears throat> we have the post game show, we have the interviews, um, film breakdowns is a lane that I'm really trying to build out right now. Just looking for some consistent content to come out of that way because again, I want to be able to give the fans everything. Right? Yeah, you can have your your say in the post game show, but I also want you to learn about what's going on in the court. What are the plays they're running? Why are they doing what they're doing? And so film breakdown is, is a lane that we're really going to focus on uh, for the end of the season, as the second half of the season and, and beyond. You know, our draft show is is one that's, our draft series is one that's really been valued by the fans. You know, as we, because we're always Knicks, Knicks, Knicks 24-7, I have no time for college basketball. You know, I just I, I just don't have the time. There's, uh, this is limited time. There's only so much time in the day. So the way I pursued it is bringing on those people that do, whether it's the scouts, whether it's the bloggers for those respective schools, the people that know those prospects insides and out. That's an interview series. And that's the not the, the information that I want to give to you, the fans say, OK, here's a guy that's in the Knicks radar. Here's his strengths, weaknesses. Here's what he did this year. 
and here's the person that knows them the best, right? So I'm not going to put it put it out there like I'm, I know everybody, you know everything. No, I don't. But I'm going to bring you the guy that does, and we're, and we're all going to learn about it, not just me, but not just you, but me as well. So that the draft series has been really uh, uh, valuable for the fans, especially with uh, most recently with uh, Quentin Grimes, because a lot of the scouts I had on, we, we covered Quentin Grimes um, from very early in the draft process. And then the fact that we got him, you know, it was like the fans really knew who this guy was because we had several uh, scouting candidates from, you know, Jonathan Wasserman, Bleacher Report. We have my guy David Zenon, uh, a skills trainer who covered these guys. Um, uh, my guy Raphael Barlow does great work. Corey Tolliver does great work. And so, again, we, we get that information uh, firsthand from these guys, and, and it's very valuable. So, you know, just continue to build on the content mix, continue to to expand the audience. We're creeping up on 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. I think that's a pretty big uh, milestone for a niche product like ours. And, and just look, really just looking forward to that, man. So just continue to expand and, and grow the channel is the goal. Is there anything that I haven't covered that you would like to add um, in this story, delving into um, black YouTube voices mm -hmm. covering the Knicks media or NBA in general? No, I would say that's it, man. I, I would just say, you know, now it's, it's, it's the golden age of media. We're at a point where our, our connectivity globally is so... Um, you know, it's so easy to, to reach out and connect with someone who has shares a similar interest, who shares a similar passion as you do. And I just think it's, it's just an op it's just, there's just so much opportunities out here for people who want to jump into the game. And again, as I said, with, with consistency, you, you can grow your audience, you know, because we're, we're becoming more, you know, we're, we're the cord cutting generation now. Everybody is curating the content that they want to consume. And it's, it's according to what you're interested in. And you're, you're, you're investing in, you're subscribing to those communities that are specializing in that domain. So it's, it's, it's you know, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's, it's a lot of hard work. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's, it's easy to connect with that person. Or those people and, and once you have that one person it can grow exponentially as you con you know continue to be consistent in what you're doing learn from your mistakes you know uh, uh, craft your skills own your skills and, and I think the sky's the limit man so this is this is this is the gold rush in terms of uh, in terms of the media and information and so I you know I definitely encourage a lot of people uh, who, who don't seem like they have that fair shot or have that opportunity to, to build your channels up, you know, don't just wait for those big platforms to give you an opportunity just go out and make your own lane. Because again, it's, it's very easy to get started. It's not easy to stay in it, but it's very easy to get started. So that, that, that's what I would say as a, as a final word. What year did you guys start and what are your streaming numbers now in terms of subscribers and, uh, average streamers? <sighs> I, I started in 20 June of 2017 and like I said, you know, the numbers were, <laughs> it wasn't anything crazy, but as you see that you begin to, to tweak and learn and tweak and learn and, and you iterate, you continue to do that. And so I went from doing pre-recorded content and then I was like, you know, this is taking too much time. I don't have a video editor. I'm doing all this on my own to I'm doing it live and I'm going to try to put out as polished of a product as I can live so that when it's consumed, it can be consumed that way, you know, with limited t cuts, limited edits, just go straight, straight off the dome, straight off the cuff. And the post game show has been that it's, it's a live straight to you, <laughs> very little, you know, agendas or anything like that. We know what we're going to talk about. We know when we're going to go to the calls. We know when, when we're going to wrap up, it's whenever we want. That content's going to the po podcast po content, you know, to be consumed. So now we have, on average, we get about, uh, say, 2,000 live viewers. Uh, each of our post-game shows, you know, if it's a major win, can can get up to about uh, 30,000 views before, you know, it's on to the next. Because, that, you know, you have games every other day. On a bad night, it may go, you know, 18 and 20,000 views. So the, the growth has been has been tremendous. The engagement rate has been tremendous as well. I'm proud of you, man. Good job. Congratulations on building a product organically. 
from a ground up for the people by the people. It's a, it's a rare to see that sustained. Mm-hmm. And you have done that over the course of now, what, going on since five, six years. Uh, hard to do, and you've done it. So um, I'm very proud to be a Knits fan and have that outlet yeah. uh, to build a community with. Appreciate it, man. And yeah, I would just say, you know, lastly is just to thank the fans because it's it's their it's from their support why I've gotten you know the opportunities that I've gotten and how this channel has grown so much. Yeah, as you continue to grow, man, people just will just reach out like, yo, I want to be a part of this. I want to help. I had a guy in the early beginnings. Um, I don't know. His, I forgot his full name, but I just call him Shells. His name is Shells Heavy in the chat. I completely forgot his, his full name is slipping me right now. Well, I call him Shells. I just know him as Shells. And he's he's up in uh, Niagara Falls, New York. And two years ago, he reached out. He's like, yo, listen, I'm sending you a box of merch right now so for you to give away. And every season, it's been like a tradition. He sends me a box. It'd be like assorted uh, jerseys, shirts, hats, all type of stuff. And And it's just people like him will just reach out to you on a whim and just say, hey, how can I help? This this is what I can do for you. How can I help? And and this is why we're here. You know, it's it's a real community um, effect. And, you know, I'm just grateful for it, man. And, you know, I was too. You, you inspired me to, to start writing about basketball in the Knicks mm. and inspired me to, to, to pitch this story and to write this story mm. on Rising DIY Knicks Media. So mm-hmm. I, I appreciate ZP. I appreciate the time. No problem. No problem, man. Anytime.